Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today to get to do this. Uh, it's quite striking to see the difference between this session and the session we ran in this very same room two years ago when Stephanie Teasley and Steve Lon and I started this out. There were, you know, a little sprinkling of people. We had a couple bagels and a, and a jug of orange juice. I think that was about the extent of it. Uh, so it's been great to watch this process grow. I, I retain my enthusiasm for what we'll be able to do with learning analytics and I hope that you will agree. What I'm going to do today is to talk about where we are in this process of learning analytics at Michigan. I'm going to provide an update on what's happened with the task force uh, and a, a sense of where we're headed over the next couple of years. And along the way, I just want to show you a bunch of results because it's always really interesting to look at results. So I'll show you a bunch of the things that have emerged, some of the different projects that have been going on. Um, We've reached the point where there are far too many projects for me to be able to talk about all of them. And there are many of them well outside my control. I don't know what's going on with a lot of these projects, right? So I won't talk about all of them. I'll just talk about a couple of things that I've been involved with and give you a sense of where some of these things are headed. I've been using this picture for learning analytics talks, which I seem to be giving every other day. Um, because it's the light shining in on the campus, right? And that's what we want to do, shine a little light in on the campus. Well, <laughs> it, it would be the meteorologist who would notice that. And that's part of the whole metaphor, Perry, right? It's really foggy. We've got to burn off that fog, right? OK. We won't go any far. That's enough. Uh, so I'll just remind you that there is this learning analytics task force, and it has a charge which has three big parts to explore the information environment we have on campus um, and to think about how we can make changes to it that would make it really easy for people to learn things from data that would support their teaching, support their learning if they're students. So we're working on that kind of thing. We were charged with funding a series of the best proposed learning analytics projects here at Michigan. The reason being, we wanted to explore what could be done in this space, and we know the best way to explore it is to let our colleagues do the things that they want to do. So we have funded a set of projects. We will continue to do that for a bit. We're also doing a review of the various metrics that are used to reflect teaching and learning on campus. One of the key ones being the teaching evaluation system that we use on campus. And Mika lavak Monti will be talking about that in a couple of weeks, the project that's been going on to, to think about that. There are many other numbers that are used to reflect teaching and learning on campus, though, as well. For example, there are key performance indicators that deans and department chairs talk about a lot. They are often the only proxy for the quality of teaching in that discussion. And they're often not really a great number to be talking about. So we're also thinking about all those numbers. And what could we give people to use that might be more reflective of what everyone really cares about? This task force has a three-year charge. We've finished the first year. In fact, we're sort of about a year and a half into it now. We're about halfway through. In that first year, we began the Exploring Learning Analytics Grants Program. We ran a first Learning Analytics Fellows Program. And we chose to continue this SLAM series, which actually started independently before the Learning Analytics Task Force existed. As we go into the remaining years, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this as we go along, but we will be finishing up the Exploring Learning Analytics Grant Program. Probably we'll have one or two more calls. We will continue the SLAM series and we'll run at least one more fellows program. The task force itself is going to take what it's learning about all these things and I think design a suite of tools that will be constructed that will provide access, easy access, to as large as possible an audience for some of the information that we think will be valuable. So where we really are right now is thinking about those tools. What, what is it we want, to, we want people to be able to see? How do we want to display it? How do we make sure we're taking care of all the issues about privacy and things that are involved in that access? So we're beginning the process of design for those tools. All right. These are, this is a quick list of the people who are currently on the Learning Analytics Task Force. Um, if you know any of them, feel free to bug them about this process. Um, we have had this SLAM seminar series for a couple of years now, and all of them fortunately have been filmed and are put online. So this, these are the SLAM seminars that took place during the last academic year. Like this academic year, they contain both a bunch of people who are here on campus, um, people who are our colleagues here, like Bill Gehring and Joanna Marecki-Milenchik, 
uh, but also a bunch of people from off campus. So you can see there people like George Siemens, who's one of the leaders of the Society of Learning Analytics Research, a big thinker on this, David Niemi from Kaplan and so on. Lots of different people coming in. We have people coming from Google this term and, and, and all that. This series has also actually been fairly visible nationwide because it's brought in these people who went out and talked about it. That's been a good thing. And because we put them all online, that also has been kind of useful uh, to us. So Michigan is well into this conversation about what's going on with learning analytics. Let me give you a little report on the Exploring Learning Analytics Grants program. So we offered the opportunity to, to, to get support to do learning analytics projects for one or two years, typically at the 50 to 150K level. We provide some support for people who are getting these grants so we can consult with people. We can provide expert consultation about what kinds of data is available and how to get it. Um, some technical assistance for actually pulling the data. It's also possible to get consultation if you don't really do this kind of statistical analysis all the time. You can get some help with how to do that and help with getting the IRB approval that you might need in order to do this work. We've, we've funded eight projects so far and I've got a list of them up here. They involve a variety of people, although three of them involve Steve Lon. Um, <laughs> he's a hardworking guy, you know. Uh, in a bunch of different areas, some, some arts projects, library projects. Uh, some of them are just examining the data to try and understand what's going on. Others are interventions. And I'm going to use as an example a project that I've been heavily involved with, give kind of an update on this, the eCoach system. So we have developed a system here that uses learning analytics as a tool for then interacting with students. And I'm going to use that as an example of one of these exploring learning analytics projects. So eCoach aims to work on the fact that large lecture classes are impersonal. Usually what they give to students is very generic advice um, and, and generic encouragement, right? We say the same thing to everyone. So whatever it is, they get the same thing. That's what I mean when I say generic. Ideally, student support would be very aware of the individual nature of every student. We would know that students are there for different reasons, with different goals. They have different backgrounds. Their status, of course, is very different, one from the other. Some are doing great. Some are really struggling. They come in with different kinds of confidence. They're headed to different places, right? All of those things are the kinds of things we would like to speak about if we could when the students sat in our office hours. But when you have 700 students in class, you don't do that. So, we have adopted a system to use computer-tailored communication, a system that actually was developed here in the Michigan School of Public Health to provide that kind of personalized support at scale. And I think this is just one example of, of the many ways in which technology can help increase the personalization of education. The 20th century, you know, a 20th century model of education was really industrialized. We really thought it was okay to put 700 people in the seats because after all, they were all interchangeable rivets, right? But they're not really. And we don't really have to treat them that way going forward because technology can help to uh, increase personalization. So two years ago, I looked back when I spoke at this series, two years ago we had just written this chalkboard the day before which was sort of the plan for how this thing was gonna work. We hadn't done it yet. Now we have done it. It's now been offered for three full te terms, each time offered to 1,900 students in all of our four large introductory physics courses. And we had in mind an idea that you take data about the students and you feed it into this system which decides or which we teach what we want to say to the students and then it feeds them out personal advice. And I just want to point out that there was in this original diagram written on my chalkboard this line that cycles back, right? So there was this forward line toward the student getting advice to the students, and then this line that cycles back that says research on it, right? Because a big part of the point was now we're gathering data about the students. We don't just want to do something and see what, you know, just let it happen. We want to find out what happened and, and then feed that back and see how we could make it work better. And we've started to realize that research cycle back. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. E-Coach was originally supported by something called the Next Generation Learning Challenge that was funded by the Hewlett and Gates Foundation. They gave us the original grant for doing this work. It is built on something called the Michigan Tailoring System that was developed here in the School of Public Health at the Center for Health Communications Research by Vic Strecker and Ed Saunders and, and their group there at the Center for Health Communications Research. So this original project was done in close collaboration with them. 
They use computer tailored communication to help people control their diabetes or lose weight. We use it to help people be successful in physics. Right? In both cases, it's advantageous to know a lot about the person you're talking to for two reasons. First of all, it changes what you want to say. Right? There's a different message for different students. But it also changes how you want to say it. Students will receive a message that comes to them in different ways, better and worse. The simplest example of this is that when Professor McKay says, here's what you need to do to be successful, the student is quite free to dismiss that advice as being irrelevant to them because Professor McKay is a physics professor and doesn't know what it's like to be a student. So a student like that is much more likely to listen to advice that comes from their roommate than they are to listen to advice that comes from me, even if it's the same advice, right? So in these systems, the tailoring that's done includes both deciding what you should say, you would say different things to different students, but also changing the way you say it so that it will be received much more openly by the students. And a good example of that is the use of testimonials. So if I want to give advice instead of me giving it, we get a Michigan student to give it. A Michigan student matched in identity and in goals to the student we're speaking to. So if you're a really nervous pre-med student in this class, we give you a testimonial from a really nervous pre-med student who says, I was terrified this was going to keep me out of med school, but I learned that if I did these three things, you know, I could be successful. So they hear it from them, they don't hear it from me. Okay, how does it work? Well, basically it has this core, this open source software system around which everything is built. That software system doesn't know anything, it can't say anything, we have to put everything into it, but it enables us to deliver these messages. So what are the things that go in? The first most important thing that has to go into this system is we have to tell it what to say. We have to know what to say. So, if, so what we did in order to decide what to say about this was to interview a very large number of people about what would you say to students in different kinds of circumstances in physics. And it turned out that the students were the most valuable source of information. For the same kind of reason that I, that I mentioned when I talked about myself giving advice, each of us as a faculty member has a pretty limited experience of what it's like to be a student. We've only done it a few times, right? The students have actually, among them, experienced everything. Right? So by polling them, we got lots of different kinds of input from the students. The students were, were a great source for this. So we have to decide what to say. Then we have to gather the information about the students. And this is done as part of the system. They receive a survey that asks them a bunch of things about themselves and their background and where, they, where they're going and why they're taking this class and their affect toward physics and everything else. Then we combine those two things inside the MTS system and are able then to deliver these individually personalized messages, which I always try to think of as, as nothing more than saying what I would like to say to that student if they sat in front of me. Right? Not really, it's not magic, it's not, it shouldn't be creepy, right? It's just trying to say what we want to say. It's nothing different. Okay? All the real effort, of course, is out here. That's where the, the hard work is. And it's not, it's not um, I don't want to sell it short, it's actually really hard to decide what you would say to people in all these circumstances and how to do it. Okay. So this is a quick example of what it looked like when we were running it in the physics classes. So this is a student, Adrienne, who happened to get an 80 on the first exam. That's good. It was better than she thought she would. She, we asked them about their, about their values so that we could feed that back to them, thinking about values affirmation kind of intervention so you can see some stuff about what she had written about her values and what she's involved with. Um, we give students grade predictions so they know exactly where they stand in the class and we can talk to them about that, where, how they're doing. So at the end of exam one, this student has grades for these things that are gray. We are predicting those other things in like the most trivial way you can, saying you're going to get the same exam score you just got. All right? It's nothing more than they would do. But it shows up right here so, so they can see exactly where they stand. And then we give them the opportunity to fiddle with the future. Well, what if you got different exam scores? And, you know, what if I got an 80 or an 85, right? And they can sort of see how their outcomes would change. Um, this just gets them, it, makes, it helps to make sure they're aware of where they are. Right? That's a powerful tool for them. They like it a lot. They, they find it in, uh, enjoyable. We give them things like this. So this is a score distribution for this, this exam. Uh, here's where they stand, all that kind of stuff. Right? All this stuff can be produced automatically for each student individualized. Right? 
Okay. Let me talk a little bit about the impact of these first three terms. We just finished doing a little bit of research about this. I'm going to send some things by faster than you can fully digest them. Let me just start by saying that our, our studies of historical data show that the best predictor of student grades in these classes is their GPA and other classes at Michigan. So I will be showing you how they perform compared to other people with the same Michigan GPA. In fact, we use a, a, a measure called the better than expected score which actually takes the grade of this student, compares that grade to the average grade of students with the same incoming GPA. So we're comparing you to students who come in with the same GPA. So we look at that difference and then we divide it by the dispersion in GPA at that, or sorry, the dispersion in grade at, for those students with that GPA. So it's kind of an effect size kind of measure for um, what happens to an individual student. In order to understand the impact of eCoach, we divided the students into four different groups of usage. It was totally optional, the usage of eCoach. And so we have a group of people who never signed up for it. We have a group of people who signed up for it but hardly touched it. A group of people who signed up for it used it a little. And then a group of people who were high users. All right. The usage is based on both visits to the system, how many times did they come, and how extended was that? How many different independent weeks did they come? Because we want them to see a number of different messages. Okay. So this is some quick descriptive characteristics. Um, about 10% of the people are, are high users in this group. This is again totally voluntary. These groups are different. You can see they come in with different incoming GPAs. Non-users 2.92, 3.04, 3.15, 3.28. Okay, so one of the issues for systems like this is that good students tend to use the resources you give them more than students who maybe need it. All right. Um, let me just show you some more results. So this is this gives you the three different terms that are broken out in that way and the, the behavior is sort of a reasonably similar in those three different terms. If you look at the number of unique weeks that visited, high users are coming at least five or six weeks. Uh, people who are low users are basically coming once. So that's why they're, they're not really being impacted. They're not doing much. Okay. So we have them split into these four different user groups. We've calculated for each student a better than expected score. And, and remember that better than expected score is comparing them to the non-using students with the same GPAs that they have. And this is the sort of basic result of it. Non-users, by definition, have a BTE score of zero because we have calibrated it on them. Low users actually have slightly lower better than expected scores. So that's an interesting thing which held up over three different terms. There's a, a set of students who maybe they're nervous and they try to do this, but then they don't stay engaged. I'm not really sure. And then the moderate and high users actually are showing real improved scores. Okay. Um, you know, we looked at some of the different user group characteristics like their, in, like their SAT math scores and their ACT scores and whether they had AP Physics in high school and whether they had BC Calculus and they're not really very different, right? So it's not these kind of characteristics that are separating these groups of students. I want to give one example of a way in which gathering more information about the students than the registrar usually has is valuable. So students can take high school physics, but they can take a lot of different kinds of high school physics. And there's nothing really easy to interpret in the student record about what kind of high school physics we had, they had. So we asked them in the survey. And we can not only ask them, did you have AP physics or not? We can ask them, was your physics class a joke? Or was it great? Something that only they know, right? But they do know it. <laughs> They're quite confident about it. So we can now look at the impact on different groups of students for the people who signed up for eCoach. We know what high school physics they took, right? So here's an interesting plot of, of this. This is now showing low users, moderate users, and high users. And this is that BTE score again, broken out for three different groups. People who took no high school physics, people who took a non-AP high school physics class, and people who took an AP high school physics class. All right? First of all, using eCoach seems to help all of these groups. A little extra training in how to be a successful physics student is a good thing. But there's a big difference among these groups because of their experience in high school. Right. Okay. 
We have talked about for a while now the fact that, that a number of large introductory courses have gender performance differences. I just want to, for those of you who haven't seen this before, let me explain quickly. This is incoming GPA at University of Michigan. This is outgoing grade in Physics 140. Each of these points represents four people with that GPA, the average grade and the error on that average grade. The points on the top reflect the average grades for male students in this class. The points on the bottom reflect the average grade for female students in this class. There's lots of overlap between these distributions. There's nothing like fade in this, right? It's just that the means are different. They really are. All right. So we've known about this. When we started doing eCoach, one of our goals was to try to reduce this gender performance gap. We, we did a few things inside the system that we hoped might have an impact. All right. But what we see is that we haven't had an impact. So here are the BTE scores for the four user groups of male and female students. And so you can see that although, again, both groups of students see some Im improvement from being involved in the system, it hasn't closed that gap at all. So we need to think hard about what we might do in the system that might have an effect on this gap. All right. So that's what we have done and a little bit of the research to show that even the you know, sort of clunky system that we initially put in place is helpful to students. What's happening right now is eCoach is being offered in physics again, all four of the classes, but also in Chem 130 and Stats 250 and MCDB 310, which is an introductory biochem class. There are today 5,183 students enrolled in those classes. So it's reaching a lot of different people. In order to do this, Remember, when we did it for physics, it was sort of, we could decide what to say to physics students. I knew something about that. The people who were working on it knew something about that. To do this for the other classes, we had to build teams in those other classes of people who had expertise there and could connect to the students there and all of that. So we now have an e-coach development team, which includes people in physics, but also in statistics and in chemistry and in MCDB. And this expansion project has been supported both by an Exploring Learning Analytics grant, which paid or helped to pay for the chemistry, biology, and physics part, and an NSF grant, which has helped to support the statistics part of this expansion. Um, the system is growing up. It, it, it looks much more swanky now than it used to. So I'll just show you a couple of pictures. Now when you go to eCoach, there's lots of courses, so you have to decide which course you're in, right? You click the button and you enter the, the coach for the the course that you're interested in. And I'll just show you the front pages of a couple of these. This is the Stats 250 one. Brenda Gunderson has always used get things done lists for students. But she's usually just handed them out on C-Tools and they use it or they don't, right? Now the get things done list is built into the system. So they click it, they can click things off as they go. And we can say, that's great, you got that done, right? You know what I mean? We can interact with that kind of thing. I'll, I'll point out that there's a link here to Problem Roulette. I'm gonna say something about that in a second too. Here's the chemistry one. Really, that's the image they chose to put on their front page, so. <laughs> Everybody makes choices. Um, you know, you see they have, they, have, they have different, you know, a different approach to what they want to do in the, in, in the way they want to design it. And that's a great thing to see. People are trying out different kinds of things to see what might, you know, what different kinds of things might work better. And then this is the MCDB one. The MCDB one is really very punchy. They think they've got much more mature students and they just have to give them the stuff and they can run with it, right? Probably true, we'll see. Okay, I wanted to say a little bit about this problem roulette tool. This is a, 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 an interesting example of a way to um, use analytics and also to gain a lot more information about what's going on with the students. This was built by my colleagues in physics, especially Gus Everard and students working with Gus. Um, its idea is to do something very lightweight to give people a practice tool. Students who are practicing for exams in these classes would really like to do real exam problems from here at Michigan. They want to know it's authentic. It's not enough to send them to the textbook and say do textbook problems because then they'll say, oh, they're totally different, right? So Gus and his, his students built this tool that allowed them to take every problem from old exams in physics and stick each problem in a Google Doc. So they're all just stuck in a bunch of Google Docs, right? And this very lightweight interface, which you can use on your cell phone, then says, all right, you're a student in physics, you want to practice for exam two. And you just say, give me a problem. And it gives you a problem at random from that system. All right, so here's an example. This is one that's just been put in for stats 250. So this is a real question that they gave on an exam at some point in the past. It's got a description of some 
question. And it asked in the study the amount of weight lost in pounds is the blank variable, you know, whatever. It's the question they would ask on their exam. The student can, then goes in and puts in the answer. And when the student puts in the answer, it immediately tells them whether they've got it right. It tells them the distribution of all the answers everyone's put in. It tells them how long they took to do the problem. And it tells them the distribution of how long it's taken everyone to do this problem, right? So it's building up student performance data in real time in a really lightweight, simple way. All right. They also get a list of every problem they've ever done. It keeps their history so they can see how many problems they've done and which ones they got right and which ones they got wrong. They can sort it and say, oh, show me the ones I didn't get right and I'm going to look at those again or whatever they want to do. All right. Um, we learned from students that they, they have found that this is a very useful way to spend the bus ride between Central Campus and North Campus. Right? You just got a couple of minutes. You got your cell phone. Do, do a couple of physics problems, right? So we're, we're latched onto that idea and we're actually going to put some advertisements in the bus now that say, okay, you're sitting here. Do some problems. Get your problem roulette out, right? Anyway, but you know, the, the thing that we haven't seen yet, although we're doing it right now, is that now we can pull the data from this and talk to the student about it in eCoach. So a week before the exam, we can tell them, you know, look, the average student in the class has done 35 problem roulette problems. You've done 70, so great, good for you. Or maybe you've done none. <laughs> Whichever it is, they'll, they get some normative in information from it. So that's something we'll be doing this term for the first time. This is from the paper we're writing right now about problem roulette. Um, I'll let you guess what that shows. <laughs> it's pretty easy to tell. How many tests do we have in the physics class? Um, it's pretty striking. The rise and then the, the sudden collapse. Um, it, the, one, the one thing I like to see here is that there's a little bit more activity the whole time between the, the last exam and the final. You know, some of them are sticking to it. Anyway, um, you can imagine the analyses you could do here. Like, does it matter when you do those problems? Do people who do them more regularly do better? You know what I mean? And once you learn, then you can share it with the students and say, look, that's a, a, an approach that's better. Okay. Let me go on. Let me talk a little bit about the Learning Analytics Fellows Program. So we did run one last winter. It was run essentially like a class. We had 32 people involved in it, and we met for two hours a week, doing some projects, doing some training, having discussions, trying to figure out what we should think about issues of privacy and, and, and ethics, what good statistical approaches were, whatever. There was one immediate consequence that came out of the Fellows Program. It gave us 32 people to explore a bunch of data so we all of a sudden had a resource, right? And, and they went out and explored a bunch of data. And we learned some really interesting things about student performance patterns in class. And I'm going to show you a couple of those things now. So remember, um, well, remember the figure that I showed you for physics, where you had the GPA in other courses on this axis and the average grade on, on this axis. This is the same kind of figure now shown for Econ 101. The points that you see there are the means and the errors on the mean for each of the students in each of those GPA bins. The dashed lines show the one sigma dispersion for students. So there are, of course, students who get grades higher than their GPA in Econ 101, but not a very large fraction of them, about 30%. Most students are getting grades that are lower. Um, we measure something for each class now that I have come to call a grade penalty. I'm not sure everybody likes to hear it discussed that way but that's what I'm calling it. It is the average of the difference between your GPA and the grade in the class. Okay, So when a grade penalty is positive, the average person is paying a grade penalty for being in this class. They're getting, their GPA goes down on average. All right. So that's just what that is. You average over all these things, you get an average value. And the number that's down here is that average value for Econ 101, about 0.4 on a four point scale. Okay. So that's Econ 101. This is that gender performance difference in Econ 101. So one of the things we discovered in the Learning Analytics Fellows Program is that um, patterns like this are not very specific to a topic like physics. They're more widespread than we knew. All right. Let me show you another class. This is Psych 111. Psych 111 is pretty consistent with people's grades in other classes. It has a small, what we might call a grade bonus, a negative grade penalty. Okay. It's not very large, though. And you can see that things are reasonably consistent. There's also not much gender performance difference. In fact, female students do a little better in this course than male students. Uh, in their GPAs overall on campus, female students do better than male students. So on, in the average class on campus, that's the case. 
Okay. So going back to this kind of figure, you know, we have two numbers here that we might talk about. Let me go back to econ and do that. There's two numbers here we might talk about. The, the overall course grade penalty, like that. And then the difference between the grade penalties of male and female students. Okay? Those are two, two numbers that I might calculate for any class. So what we did in coming out of the Learning Analytics Fellows Program was to calculate numbers like that for all of the what I've come to call giant classes on campus. So all 38 classes that have average enrollment over the time period we looked at of more than 400. Okay. So on this axis is the course's grade penalty, that first number. So does every student on average get a grade that's lower than their GPA or higher than their GPA? That's what's shown on this axis. On this axis is the difference between the male and female grade penalty. So courses that are on this side of the plot are courses where male students do better. Courses on this side of the plot are courses where female students do better. And when we made this plot for the first time, there was a striking pattern in it. The striking pattern is there's a big group of classes down here that includes every one of our introductory STEM classes. Physics 1 and 2 in both sequences, Calculus 1 and 2, Biology 1 and 2, Chemistry 1, 2, and 3, and Econ 1 and 2. Okay? We didn't know this until we did this research starting last January. It's a striking thing, and what I think is the, the strongest thing that's shared among these classes is that these are all classes that base most of their grade on timed examinations, and in particular on examinations that are mostly multiple choice and short answer kind of examinations. Right. I'm not sure this is the only thing those, those classes share, but it is a feature that they share. I would point out that these same science disciplines that are down here, most of them have laboratory classes. Those laboratory classes are all up here. Those laboratory classes are evaluated in very different ways. They're evaluated with work that you work on until you are happy with the result and you turn it in. Different kind of evaluative system. I'm leaning on this because it's my favorite theory. I have no idea if this is right yet, right? I could be totally wrong, but this is the thing that I, I am investigating because I want to know more about. It. So what, what do I think this could be going on here? The same kind of pattern, of course, is seen in a lot of standardized testing environments here in the United States. This is the difference in SAT math scores for males and females from 1972 to 2012. Right? Same kind of evaluative environment, same kind of penalty. This year in the honors program, our summer book that we had all incoming students read was Whistling Vivaldi, a book by Claude Steele about stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is perfectly capable of creating these kind of 10% performance differences among people. I mean, 20 or 30 years of research now shows that that's the case in, in repeatable ways. The fact that this is so, what Steele calls law-like, right? All these classes? Really? It's not like econ and physics and chemistry got together and set something up to make this happen, right? I mean, so there's something else going on. So I'm really curious to know what would happen if we changed the style of evaluation. Right? It could be that this is an important factor in this. Okay. Um, let me just tell you about a little more about what the fellows program was like. We, we met for a couple of hours. The goal was for everybody to learn about the data that was available, to do some projects, to explore this, to get more familiar with using data, uh, and to be able maybe to develop their own proposal. Uh, that they, could, that they could then use to, um, to explore a question that they brought to the topic. Okay, I'm going to tell you about a little bit of work on uh, new work on looking at student trajectories through the campus. We have been bringing together records, student records for the 1996 to 2012 period for all kinds of classes and beginning to examine how students move through the course sequences of departments. And I show this partly to hopefully inspire you to think about tools that might be valuable to you in thinking about your own students moving through departments. I've made a few plots here because they were interesting to me, but you know there are other things that will be interesting to other people. Okay, so here's an example of, of the kind of plot we might make to show you how what's happening in the department. This plot shows the average number of students enrolled in a class as a function of their average age on campus, which runs from 0 to 4. 
Right? So who are the students? You know, how long have they been around? Are they freshmen or sophomores? And how many students are in the class? So a plot like this could be made for every department. It might be interesting to the department to be able to look at this. For us, you can see we have introductory sequences, physics 140 and 240, physics 160 and 260, or one, uh, yeah, 160 and 260 are right down here, and then 135 and 235. You see they reach people at different ages while they're on campus. Students take these at really different times. And then all our physics major classes are these tiny low enrollment ones down at the end here. Here's um, a figure showing the same classes, but now showing their gender representation. What is the fraction of female students in these classes? And we have three introductory sequences in physics. One that was primarily, is primarily delivered to students in the engineering college, one that's primarily for pre-professional students, and an honor sequence, which is where we would love to have people who are really excited about physics go. It's a place we would like to recruit our majors from. Right? So here are those three sequences. That's the honors one. It starts out with 20% female enrollment in the first class and falls going into the second one. This is the engineering one. That's basically governed by the fraction of women who are students in the College of Engineering. And then this is the life science sequence. So if we wanted to have access to students who take this sequence and decide when they take it, physics is pretty cool. I might like to study that then this doesn't work because they're not taking it until the end of their sophomore year. Right? So thinking about things like this may be valuable to departments. Okay. Tim, what's Physics 420? That is uh, a physics course taught to elementary education students. Okay. Here's the same kind of, I'm just going to go through these quickly. This is the same kind of plot for history. I got a lot of classes. And here's the gender representation plot for history. I don't know. If you knew what these course numbers were, it might be really interesting to you. I guess. <laughs> All right. Here's average grades for the same list of classes as a function of where they are in their, in their time on, class, on, on campus. And the first thing that strikes me about this is that it, boy, it's kind of all over the place. I didn't know how all over the place it was before we did this, but it is kind of all over the place. Here it is for history. Mostly it's not that different, right? It's mostly pretty similar. The difference is there's some introductory courses with really low grades over here, right? But mostly, you know, it's not, not very different. Um, we talked about this gender performance gap in the introductory courses. So this figure shows those same average grades with male and female points. The course number is written under the blue male point for each course. So there's that physics 140 class with that gender performance difference. Physics 240 there, right? What you would find if you look at this is classes that are lab classes and advanced lab classes have higher female grades than male grades. And uh, the other un unusual exception is, is quantum mechanics. Okay. Here's history. I know you can't read it, okay, but you know, there it is. Um, and in this case, you will see there are a lot of red dots sticking out. It means there must be blue dots somewhere down below that go to those classes, right? <laughs> Just so you can see. Okay, and then this is an example that I shared with people in the philosophy department. Anyone who read the New York Times last week, I think it was, would have seen five essays about the representation of women in philosophy nationwide. And uh, recently there was a conference on diversity in philosophy at, in, in Dayton at which I, I, I spoke. And I showed some data like this. There's a list of their classes, the, the, the fraction of women who are taking them. Here is a line that shows the national fraction of philosophy bachelor's degrees. And you can see sort of what happens. They get to the minor, and then that's representation drops down like that. They have this one exception, right? So that's something about that class. What is it? Well, there's two things about it, I think. It's bioethics, first of all. So there are a lot of life science students interested in that. But I think it might be more than that as well. Bioethics is a very modern topic in philosophy. Students in that class are much more likely to read philosophers of all different kinds in that class. Most of these classes, they're not. Right, so that's something people are thinking about in philosophy, what they have been describing as the, the hyper-visibility of certain individuals in their curriculum. Right? Anyway, something they're thinking about. Another way of thinking about or looking at how students move on through the curriculum is to say, all right, I've got students who take Physics 140. They, almost all need to take Physics 240 as a second class, 
for the things that they're doing. So who is doing that? Who's going on and who's not? So this is a, a figure that shows the distribution of grades in Physics 140, the color in the back there. And then it shows the grades of the people who then went on and took Physics 240. All right. So what you can see is that people who are failing 140 don't go on to take 240 because they can't. This then takes the same figure right, and, and measures the fraction in each case. So here's the fraction of students who completed Physics 240 after taking Physics 140 and receiving the grade that's listed here. And we've actually broken it out into different groups, male and female students, low income and high income students. First of all, the main pattern you see is that it's not very sensitive to the grade they get whether they go on or not. There is some sensitivity, but it's not wildly sensitive. And there are some differences. In particular, female students are less likely to go on and take Physics 240 here at Michigan. It's very likely many of these students went and took it somewhere else rather than taking it at Michigan. Um, so that's the main thing you see. But you can, you, know, you can imagine any course sequence that you want to look at in this kind of way, you might want to look at and see how do, how does this, how do these factors affect things. Okay, I want to make just a quick comment about this. Good data supports grant seeking. So this summer we wrote a grant uh, to an NSF program called WIDER, which aims to increase the use of evidence-based and assessed learning in introductory STEM courses. And when we wrote that, we were able to put a lot of data into the proposal. And we got the proposal because we put a lot of data into it. All right. So this was a large proposal, $2 million, to support a three-year reform effort across physics, chem, bio, and math. Um, let me just say one more thing about that. If you are writing a proposal and you think data could be helpful, we should all talk about it because we can help get data to people who, who want to have it. I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the way of doing this work that grows itself. <laughs> we give you a little help at the beginning to get the data so you can get a bunch of money so you can do the projects you want to do. There have been some interactions with the larger community. Uh, the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference that Mary mentioned is taking place next March in Indianapolis. That's run by the Society of Learning Analytics Research. And I believe we have now become a founding member of the Society of Learning Analytics Research. So there you go. Um, it's also true that whenever I look at these things, especially these kind of grading patterns and stuff here at Michigan, I'm desperate to know what it looks like somewhere else. Right? All those other places are kind of desperate to know what it looks like in other places too. So we're, tr we're working on trying to bring together data sets. So we're exploring both parallel analyses like we'll look at it here and you look at it there. Or maybe my real goal is to bring together data so that we could do the analysis for everybody. And there, there actually was a meeting this summer about sharing data across the CIC. And we held a meeting in July. I would say there's been progress here. It's kind of slow. but. You know, people are a little hesitant, but I think we're going to make progress. And I can show you just one quick example of that. An attempt at parallel analysis. This is not, a, not maybe the best slide, but let me see if I can just make one example. So here's our Physics 140 plot showing the gendered performance difference that I already told you about. Here's their Physics 1101 plot showing a gendered performance difference at the University of Minnesota. All right. So a, a guy at the University of Minnesota went and compared exactly the same classes that I provided for them. And what they see is a gendered performance gap in their introductory physics class, kind of like the one that we see in our introductory physics class at Michigan. So this was very cool. It already opens the door to doing parallel analyses. Unfortunately, he did it wrong. Not like grossly wrong, but wrong in just the kind of way that plagues doing parallel analyses. You've got to do exactly the same thing. So I don't know if anybody can see something on these figures that reveals what he did wrong. You don't have to, I'll tell you, don't worry. <laughs> Notice how everyone who has a 4.0 here has a 4 there. Right? What he put on the x-axis is not their grades in the other classes, it's their grades in all the classes, including this one. Right? That was easier for him to do, and he did it. And it still shows you that there's this gap, right? But it means that you're going to reduce it because you've included this grade in the comparison. And for a class that's taken early on in a student's career, you reduce it a lot. So you might notice that all his uh, grade penalties are smaller than the ones we see at Michigan, or almost all chemistry. They beat people up over there. And that's because he's done this. Right? So that's why I want to bring data together rather than, <laughs> than do parallel analyses. But you know, we'll do what we can. Okay. 
Another thing that's happened over the past year is Michigan's gotten very involved with Coursera and offered a number of classes. Um, the data from those classes is now flowing into Stephanie Teasley's use lab and they are working on the analysis of that and in a couple of weeks, a month or so, I think they're going to give a talk here in the SLAM seminar about what they're finding about Michigan's MOOC classes. This is an area where I think uh, parallel analysis with other institutions will work much better. The data is the same. All these different places that are running Coursera classes have at least largely the same data. So uh, it may be possible to build in comparisons between institutions a lot earlier for this data. So that's going to be really interesting. I have no idea what they're finding. We will have some comparisons with some similar data from Stanford. Yeah, great. I mean, I think it's going to be, well, we can't wait. Okay. What's coming with the LAPS process? So what we're, what we're doing now is there will be so, a report with some suggestions for adjustments to the teaching evaluation process. Mika will talk about that next time. And really what I want to do this year is work on design requirements for tools which will expose the right kinds of data to all the audiences that could benefit from having access to data. Tools that would allow students to learn things about what kinds of students take this class and how does it work out for them? What does it lead to in the future? You know, whatever you think is good, authentic thing a student should be able to know, we want to expose to them. Faculty members have many questions, administrators have other questions. So we'll be looking for suggestions about what these tools ought to do. I'm trying to think about entrepreneurial ways of doing this. Maybe we should have contests or something, I don't know. Uh, but we really do want to try to draw in ideas from as many people as possible. There is a new SLAM series this year. Um, the schedule's online. You've got it on your chairs, I guess. It's not even only online. And we will be running a new learning an analytics fellows group starting in January 2014. Um, It'll be a little smaller, we think, and probably a bit more focused. We don't know exactly what it looks like yet. We're thinking about it, but we will put out an announcement on October 15th about what it is and what we want, what we're, what we're hoping for, and the applications will be due in November. And it'll run in the, the, in the winter term, just like the one did last year. So that's a quick update of what's going on and a little teaser of a bunch of different data. We are awash in it right now, and there's, it's a really fun time to be involved in this work. Thank you very much. from anyone. Okay. I don't have a question. I'm going to put in a plug since there weren't any questions. The Learning Analytics Conference that Tim mentioned, I'll encourage you to think about whether you have work that would be perfect at a conference. It's a, it's a new conference. It's an area that's growing and learning and deciding what learning analytics is in this uh, organization and the conference a place where we're figuring that out together. So you don't have to have GPAs as outcome measures. You don't have to, I don't know how many students attended class. What you have to be thinking about is how generate, how data that's generated can be used in service of better understanding learning, the processes of learning, and how to support those processes of learning. And that can be anything from engagement to uh, test taking whatever. So um, think broadly and if you have any questions about is your work something that might be of interest to that conference? My answer is probably yes if you're sitting in this room. <laughs> but if you want to know more specifically, I am the program co-chair for the conference this year um, and I can tell you some things about that. The other thing to note is the way a new community grows is by having people come in, take a look and see if they belong there and if they're sure that they do but don't quite feel it to make sure that people in that community know why they're there and why they want to hook in. So you can do that by submitting papers, you can do that by attending the meeting, um, and you can do that by offering to be reviewers for the next conference that comes around. Because as you know, if you've ever submitted a conference paper, whether you get in or not is very dependent on who reviews your paper. So they know <laughs> the kind of thing that you're talking about. So that's just a plug. And it's in Indianapolis, cheap and easy. I think we'll all take a blue bus. <laughs> uh, it'll be a party. Okay, Melissa. So, you're, you're just stepping into these waters, you want to know what resources, you want to know what other people have done. Do you have a website that lists little project, you know, all of the activity that's been associated with this so far? We do have a website. It, 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 could, it could use a little updating. I can repeat the question. Yeah, what about where do you find out about this? Where 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 are we keeping the record of what's going on here? So 
the SLAM record is really good. We've kept everything. It's really accessible. Uh, a lot of the other activity, we have a website, a Google site, you know. I, we need to put a little effort into it right now, and now's a good time to do it. So. Yeah. You want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. I saw your hand go up. No, my other question is, what kind of data are available to, to probe with? For example, uh, sure. Google Apps. Yeah. So if we want to know what we can get from Google... Yeah, so it's a great question. The, the, there is a pool of data the university regularly keeps what you would imagine the registrar having about a student record. That student record data yeah. is very tidy. We you know, have good access prop uh, um, techniques for it, everything else. All the rest of it, you know, some places there's great data in those kind of resources. Some places it's absolutely verboten, right? You, you, you kind of have to explore a little to find out. But there's great promise in that world, but... So, if, who do you ask? I mean, where's the central... Can LATF at umich.edu? Can I get uh, Google app data? In, who, where do you go? Well, Stephanie says no. Stephanie probably knows. Google app... Uh, we should set up a question line, yeah. Yeah, in theory, yes. In practice, not yet. But, uh, but if you want to know, can you get some piece of data, you could send an email to the lab. Okay. And we'll... And we'll See what we can do. Okay. Right. You wanted to set up an ecosystem for a first semester freshman year course. No university GPA yet. Do you have any sense at all? Sure. I mean, you still know a lot about the student. They can tell you whatever they know about themselves. So knowing what their high school performance was is a little relevant, although what we find is that high school performance isn't super predictive of performance here at Michigan, you, you know this. But, their, but their, their affect, their sense of confidence, what kind of resources they have available to them for advice and so on. Get that directly from the Absolutely. You, you do it as, it's, it's all part of a survey. Right. Mary. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah, because you referenced Claude Steele, I wondered if you have done any work with anticipated that you might look at differences of the stereotype threat in students of color or white students or international right. students right. and um, U.S. nationals, et cetera, and things like sure. that. So the question was about stereotype threat and whether we've done really very much research into trying to understand different groups of people and how they might experience that stereotype threat. So the answer is not very much. We've looked at gender in these classes and that's about it. But you can see the promise or the range of things that one might explore using this kind of data. And I would add to that that if that is your area of expertise and you know and can write about what the literature to date knows and what some of the theory around why those exist, then we can use this data to test those theories right. and to investigate them further. What we don't tend to know, I don't know the less, I know vaguely the, the, the literature on gender differences, but not probably the way someone who's a scholar of that knows. And that's exactly the kind of connection we need between these kind of domain experts and the available data because you're the one who can ask the question in the best way. Right. Want to get in? You had a question too? Yeah, you ask, you, you're basing your expectations, expect, expected grades based on GPA. Mm -hmm. Do you ever ask the students, maybe just before a drop at deadline, how they're doing, what, what, they're, what they are sure. expecting? So the question was about whether we ever ask the students about their own expectations. So I think there's two parts to that. The first is that um, students know what their GPA is very well. It forms a part of their identity. I'm a 3-3 student. I'm a 3-8 student, right? So a part of their expectation is their GPA. And that's one of the reasons why I think comparisons to it are relevant for their own sense of success or failure, right? We do, in the eCoach system, ask them what grade would you like to get? Guess what? It's an A. <laughs> what grade do you expect to get? <laughs> but that's why we also ask them what grade do you expect to get? And, and they are very clear that they don't expect to get the grade they would like to get. A lot of them are expecting to get a B minus, you know. Right? So it's interesting to know that that's where they are. And it might be that that's really consistent with their GPA or it might be that something about this class has freaked them out because they're really a 3-8 student and they think they're going to get a B minus. You know, so knowing that is is a powerful tool for speaking to them about what's going on. Yes. So you've been covering this already, but at what point are you administering this survey and what kind of response are you getting? Right. 
So the question was about at what point we administer the survey for eCoach and what kind of response rate do you get? So right now we see, we, we administer the survey at the beginning of the term. The first time they come to eCoach it says, welcome to eCoach, take the survey, right? And it takes them about 20 minutes to take the survey. Almost everyone who comes to the site does take the survey. And the rate at which they, they engage with this has varied quite a bit in these classes. So in most of, the, most of the classes right now, it's between 40 and 60% of the students who are doing it. But, there are the, but as the students get older, they're less interested in a thing like this. They think they know about all this. So engagement is a really important thing. We thought about requiring it. You, know, you must go into the system. But we didn't so far. You, you could, we just haven't. Connie, and then I'll get you soon. Jim, what makes the students decide to take the survey? Well, we, so what makes the students decide to take the survey is the question. And we, we try to give them a good reason for why they might want to use this system. So we, we visit the classes and talk about what advantages there are to being involved in the system. And I tell you things like showing them that you get to practice, do practice problems for the exam, you get to see grade predictions, stuff they want. We have to give them candy that will bring them into the system. So we do that by advertising in that way. We also send them emails, stuff like that. We try to win them over to it. Right. And Sandy, you had a question. Did you apply this one fast to maybe you sure, but is there a gender difference in who the high users are versus the low users? So the question was, is there a gender difference between who are the high users are and who the low users are? And the answer is yes. There are far more women using the system than men. They're engaging in that kind of help-seeking behavior. Well, it does improve their performance. It just doesn't close the gap. Right. Okay, if there's no more questions, there's probably a piece of baklava back there.